The reading is from Paul's letter to Titus, and it's called Titus's Task on Crete, chapter 1, verses 5 to 9. The reason I, Paul, left you in Crete was that you might straighten out what was left unfinished and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. An elder must be blameless, the husband of but one wife, a man whose children believe and are not open to the charge of being wild and disobedient. Since an overseer is entrusted with God's work, he must be blameless, not overbearing, not quick-tempered, not given to drunkenness, not violent, not pursuing dishonest gain. Rather, he must be hospitable, one who loves what is good, who is self-controlled, upright, holy and disciplined. He must hold firmly to the trustworthy message as it has been taught, so that he can encourage others by sound doctrine and refute those who oppose it. Thank you, Maureen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for your word. We thank you that we have it available in our language, that we can understand, that we can read. Lord, I pray that we don't take it for granted, that it sits there on our shelves sometimes but doesn't get read. Help us to dip into it regularly, to hear what you're saying to us, as your Holy Spirit reveals to us the words that you wish to say. And may you do the same now for us here. Lord, I'm not so much interested on uh, any words I might speak, eloquent or otherwise, but I'm interested that people might hear you speaking to them um, for the situations that they face and for the situations that, Lord, we face as a church. Do this, I pray, for your glory and in Jesus' name. Amen. Friends, I struggled with this passage this week, and particularly yesterday. I don't think it was was about seven o'clock, I think, by the end, and I thought, well, that's it, I can't do anything more. (laughs) Um, When you look around the world today, you see many leaders or those who have been leaders that I don't think it would be very wise to emulate. Here is the first four that came to my mind. Vladimir Putin... Elon Musk, Boris Johnson, Donald Trump. (laughs) Now, whatever you might think, maybe you're a fan of some of those, I don't know. But those men, in my opinion, my humble opinion, seem to be more concerned about themselves and who they are and how they represent themselves to um, um, those that, that they seek to follow them than they are at anything about service and serving people. Now maybe people are attracted to folks like that because of their charisma or because of their sheer power, because of the opportunity that they have to speak to vast numbers of people. I don't know. But our world, our society often looks to people like that. But you know, godly leadership, which is the theme of these few verses that we're looking at today is very, very different to the way that our society looks at leadership. Leadership, certainly as far as Paul looks at it here, is more to do with character than it is to do with status. In fact, you will remember if you were here last week when we did the introduction to the letter that Paul considered himself to be God's slave only serving him and doing exactly what he wanted to be done. Can you imagine that for Putin, Musk, Johnson or Trump? (laughs) I don't think they would ever 
any of them, in all honesty, say they were God's slave. In the verses that we've read, we find at the very beginning there, verse 5, the very reason for Paul's letter. Titus has been left on the island of Crete by Paul for a specific task. I don't expect Paul would have been surprised to have got this letter because I'm sure he would have been told, in fact, we almost know he was told, that this was the job that he had in hand. It was a tough mission. You know, Crete was a big island, the fourth biggest in the uh, um, Mediterranean, and it had a very mountainous interior with few roads. And yet there were at least 20 significant settlements there. Some of them city-states who had their own currency and their own sort of government. There, were, there was lots going on on that island. There were lots, therefore, pockets of new believers around that somehow Paul and others have, have managed to uh, bring to Christ. And now Titus is being left with the job of ensuring that all of those groups have got leadership. Elders, overseers, pastors, doesn't matter what word you want to use, they all essentially mean the same thing. But in the process of giving Titus this mission, this, this role, to make sure that these, these churches, these new groups of people become churches that are well established, that can go on with God, he also gives Titus an idea of what to look for in the people who will lead. And if you move on to verses 6 to 9, you find what these um, qualities are. Now, it's not your standard CV as you'd have it today. You know, Paul isn't interested in what people can do or what they've done, their knowledge or their skills or, their, or what they've achieved. He was asking Titus to look at who the people are. Who are they? What are they like as people? What type of character do they have? That is more important than anything that they can do. Now, it should go, of course, without saying that the first thing that Titus should ensure is that they are people who are, like him and Paul, slaves of Christ, those who have become followers of Jesus, who are determined to live that life that gives everything in the service of God. That's the first and most important thing. It's so obvious that it doesn't get even mentioned here. But these are the people who will be able to guide others to a greater maturity in their relationship with Jesus Christ. And what Paul was asking Titus to do is actually something that's become common for him amongst all of the, the work that he'd done. Wherever there was a new church started, and we get a good example of this in Acts 14, Paul, there in that particular example, Paul and Barnabas have been visiting churches in Lystra, Iconium, and Pisidian Antioch, and they've returned there on their way back and made sure there are leaders there who can establish the church, help the church grow to maturity. Why? So that they can go off and carry on the work elsewhere, so that they, Paul, can continue to be the apostle of Jesus Christ, the sent one that he believed he was called to do. So what Paul is asking Titus to do here is very similar to what he had been doing previously. Paul wants Titus to look for leaders. And we get a list of things in these verses that he's to look for. And the first thing we're told in verse six, 6 is that these people, they should be blameless. Now, the Greek word apparently here is someone who no charge can be brought against them, if you like. There's nothing in their life that's gone particularly wrong, that where they have messed up, and where they themselves could be charged by anyone in the community of having failed. If you look at all those leaders that I've mentioned to you earlier on, and probably a whole load of more, 
we can all point the finger, not that we should, but we can all point the finger at some disaster in their lives that would preclude them from being blameless, certainly in the way that is referred to here. People like Boris Johnson and Donald Trump, controversy follows them everywhere, doesn't it? They're constantly blamed for all sorts of things, whether, whether they are really um, to blame for it or not. And the dirt sticks for people like that sometimes. Paul is saying, you can't have leaders, Titus, where that becomes the case, because they will dishonour the name of Christ. The people who are appointed need to be blameless. The next characteristic in this verse that's looked for is to do with their family. Um, Paul says, he should be faithful to his wife, a man whose children believe and are not open to the charge of being wild and disobedient. <laughs> now, you see, this is the sort of place where I, got, I struggled. I began to <laughs> get into difficulty. But firstly, a, a man's marriage and his home life as a whole reveal a great deal about his character and his ability to lead a, a, a church. Let's be honest, if you can lead a family, you can probably lead a church. <laughs> because it's only a whole group of families put together, isn't it? <laughs> but a faithfulness in marriage, although it doesn't guarantee that, is a good starting point for the character of someone who could lead. That's what Paul is looking for. But here's the elephant in the room. Does this statement by Paul have to be taken literally? I mean, does it mean that men who are not married or are divorced, or don't have children, or have remarried, or women, are they all excluded from the possibility of church leadership? You can see my struggle, can't you? Now, I know that it's not possible in this particular text to read in all of those other groups. It really isn't. It doesn't matter how you try to understand the original text, it can't be done in this text, okay? Believe me, you can go away and look, find, it, find it if you want, but in this text it cannot be done. This is so specific, there's no way around it. But there are other places where Paul writes where all of these groups in different ways can be included in the opportunity of leadership in the local church. So don't discount the fact from this passage that these others cannot be leaders. They can. And so what I want to focus on here more than anything else is the whole element of faithfulness that comes through from this. These folks who are going to be appointed to leadership need to be faithful in their family life and therefore in the life of the church and of course above all else faithful to the God that they serve. That's the key for me that comes through in these verses. But also in that, in that um, verse that I mentioned, there's this qualification of, of a leader has to have children that believe and are not wild or disobedient. <laughs> That's very explicit again, isn't it? Um, what Paul is effectively saying here is that the measure by which a father parents his children invest time in them, seeks to encourage them, is the same as the way that he might parent, in inverted commas, the church that he gives or is given the responsibility to look after. There's all sorts of commentaries that you can find about what this actually means, and I don't have the time, and it's not particularly profitable for us to look at those things, but you can go away, and I'm sure, and find them these days on the internet. Paul moves on then. And the next group of things he talks about are a whole load of negative characteristics that a potential leader doesn't need to have. Verse 7. Not overbearing, not quick-tempered, not dr given to drunkenness, not violent, not pursuing dishonest gain. We don't need to dwell on those particularly, do we? But I think we can all agree that those are character faults that we don't want to see 
in leaders. Now, of course, they appear from time to time in all sorts of places, and usually when they do, particularly if they're repetitive ones, they cause problems in local churches. Paul knows that they're toxic. We don't need those. And churches can be destroyed by leaders who have characteristics like that. They can literally be destroyed. Fortunately, Paul moves on to verse 8 to talk about some noble things that a leadership, that a leader should exhibit. He must be hospitable, one who loves what is good, who is self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. Now, friends, I can't claim to be all of those things all the time. But as your leader, I will endeavour to pursue them with all my strength, to demonstrate those characteristics wherever I can, and also to seek your forgiveness whenever I fail, both personally and corporately, if that's appropriate. Because those things, for a leader, are not only good to demonstrate to the whole of the congregation, the church, because they show what God, the way that God wants us to live, but also because that's the way that people are built up in Christ. That's the way the churches do grow. And the purposes of God are fulfilled. There is no doubt that leadership in churches is so important. Good leadership is so important. All sorts of aspects of that. But it starts with the character of the person. It has to start there. Before any gift mix they might have, or other things they're good at, it has to start with the character. And so we come to the final verse. Verse 9. He must hold firmly to the trustworthy message as it has been given and taught, as it's been taught, so that he can encourage others by sound doctrine and refute those who oppose it. Paul wants Titus to ensure that the accuracy of the message of Jesus Christ is taught effectively. Now, what you need to remember here is that Paul, Titus, or anyone else in that, they didn't have this wonderful book. They didn't have any of, well, they might have had I'm not even sure they would have had access to the Old Testament, to be honest with you. I don't believe they did. All they had was the odd letter, and in the case of the churches in um, Crete, they'd have seen the letter that Titus had been sent, and maybe a few um, words of the, from the life of Jesus that they'd been told, but very little else. They were reliant, essentially, on the character of their leaders and the empowering of the Holy Spirit. Now, I don't know about you, but I'd find that really scary (laughs) to be a believer in that context. You know, I really, I find the scriptures so comforting, so helpful, so directional, that to have, to not have them would be horrific. We were thinking a few weeks ago, weren't we, about the persecuted church and about the fact they can't have the scriptures. That would be what it would be like. And this is why it was so important for Paul that Titus had people who were able to use what they had and share the gospel through their lifestyle and through the few things that they knew from the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. The greatest witness to God is a life lived for him. Actually, it's, it's better even than the scriptures. You can see, it's almost like you can see the living word of God in somebody. And Paul is looking for that in leaders. Because Paul knew that the truth could and should be conveyed well to those who'd come to Christ. Just a couple of thoughts to close. Firstly, this measure for leaders is a good one for all of us. Uh, it doesn't matter, you know, what, what our role is. Um, you remember that um, we talked about um, sh- uh, being good shepherds. In fact, there were all shepherds a few weeks ago when we looked at the end of 1 Peter. Well, it's the same here. 
you know, we may not be called to all to be leaders of churches, but we're all to be called to be leaders in some context, whether we're parents or, or um, you know, or grandparents or, or some other role. We've, got, we've all got leadership roles in some shape and form. And so to take on board what Paul is saying here to Titus for leaders is something that is valuable for us. We can't just skip over these verses and say, well, they don't apply because I don't, I don't fit the bill. Look, and aspire, look at and aspire to these good qualities that leaders can have. And secondly, and this I've said it already, but it's a reminder, notice that the qualifications are more concerned with character than they are with knowledge or skill. A person's lifestyle and relationship provide a window into his or her character. And although it's important to have a pastor who effectively preaches God's word, it's, it's, it's equally important to have church members who can live out God's word and be examples for others to follow. Churches will only grow as the whole church does that, not just the pastor. And that's the challenge for us from these verses today. Let's pray. Lord, this, um, these verses of Scripture may well be putting the spotlight on uh, potential church leaders. But it also reminds us, Lord, how we should all live. People who are faithful servants of you, endeavouring to do everything that you ask of us, whenever you ask of us. It also reminds us, Lord, to pray for those who are our leaders. Help us to do that. And for those of us, Lord, in whatever leadership role we're in, whether it is leading a church or leading a family or being a grandparent or whatever it might be, help us to fulfil that role in a way that enables us to share the love of Christ, perhaps even without words, Thank you, Lord. Amen.